conversation lulled until Claire and Trevor saw the gorgeous view of the Mississippi River at night in New Orleans. There was a full moon in the sky that cast a gorgeous reflection into the water. The Crescent City Connection Bridge spanned the river, connecting New Orleans to the West Bank. The bridge was lit up and shone brightly in the dusky night sky. To the right was the central business district with all the skyscrapers lit up for the night. This was a common sight for Derek, but for Claire and Trevor it was beautiful, and they had to take a moment to enjoy it. Derek took a few casual steps back, wanting to let Trevor and Claire have some time alone. He was still determined to make a match out of them, and figured if this view wouldn't do it, it likely couldn't be done. So it came as no surprise that Derek wasn't really paying attention to anything in particular while he tried to let his friends have a second alone. Therefore, he never saw the small homeless man approach him from the left side. You're going to die, the man said, and continued to walk along the river walk. What was that? Derek called to him, but the man ignored him. Then there were more. Vagrants crawled out from beneath the piers along the river, where they frequently slept, and began walking towards Derek and his friends. Guys, check this out, he called over to Claire and Trevor who quickly came out of their trance from admiring the cityscape to realize they were being surrounded. Tobit sits upon his black throne and watches us all. Another one spoke as he walked past. You are marked by the molder of our minds. You shall scream upon the red star for all of eternity, said yet another. Claire was becoming terrified, and the three huddled together. What are they doing? What do they want? She asked, her voice laced with panic. Hail Tobit! Hail Delphia! A woman stated, moving along the river. You shall be food for our master of the void. We shall feast upon you. Another threatened. That's when Trevor realized that the vagrants weren't simply making their threats and moving on, but rather forming a human gauntlet, standing on either side of the concrete walkway. There is no escape or freedom from Tobit. There is only freedom through Tobit. Statement after statement, a litany of terror, and as each homeless person walked by stating their opinion on what fates awaited them at the hands of Tobit, they continued to form that gauntlet. Derek spun around and saw that the double row of people had also been forming behind them as well, as if all of the city's homeless had gathered up to give praise to Tobit tonight. We need help over here! Someone call the police! Derek shouted. By now, he had to shout over the homeless as even after taking their position in the lines, they would still continue to chant threat after threat. Derek looked over their shoulders, hoping to see a pedestrian, but he knew this was a rather untraveled part of the French Quarter. It had no bars or clubs. Therefore, most tourists had no interest in the river walk. From what he could tell, they were alone out here. The double line of insanity now stretched at least 50 feet in either direction. Claire had no idea if they were simply meant to walk it, like some demonic version of Soul Train, or if this was where those in Delphi had finally made their move. She realized grimly that this could very well be the end. As if that realization had been heard, the walls of people actually began to take steps forward, closing in on both sides. They'd finally coordinated their verbal threats, it seemed, as Hail Tobit was repeated over and over again. No, not this way. Follow my lead, Derek, Trevor suddenly shouted. Derek was able to look and observed as the normally peaceful and unaggressive Trevor Leary stepped forward and drove his fist into the first transient's face that he could reach. Derek understood and followed suit, striking the next one and creating a small gap. Both Derek and Trevor grabbed Claire by both hands and began to run. They made it about 25 feet before they risked a quick glance back. The lines of fanatics were still where they'd been left. They were not chasing them, it appeared. They turned to run. Desperate to get back to their hotel room, desperate just to get back to people, when suddenly the moaning began. The entire line of homeless, perhaps forty or more in all, began to emit a low, guttural, almost growling noise, coming from deep within their throats. It's just like an Epor story, Claire whispered. When the scouting party found that the primes were cannibalistic, they started doing this. I know it's the same sound. I just know it. No time for this now. We've got to get back to safety. Let's go now, Derek commanded, and they made their way quickly back into the heart of the French Quarter and into the safety of numbers. 
The trio arrived safely into the crowded mass of Taurus and finally sat down to rest on a stoop. What in the hell was that? Trevor asked. It was like when I was fleeing Delphia. All the fanatics lined up to attack. Derek replied in gasps, out of breath from running. No, I don't think it was meant as an attack, Claire corrected, also trying to catch her breath. If that wasn't an attack, then I don't know what it was. A warning, that's what I think. Just something to scare us, Claire answered. Think about it. If they wanted to attack us, grab us, throw us in the river or whatever, they had every chance right then and there, yet all they did was stand there. That was a last-ditch effort, I think, by whatever is running Delphia, to turn us away. They're damn determined, aren't they? Trevor asked, his voice settling back to its normal tone as his body recovered from the run. Yeah, but so are we. Come on, let's get back to the hotel, Derek replied. The walk back to the hotel was tense. They continued to catch glimpses of people staring at them, and their overtaxed minds now on full alert rustled with whether or not they were just still being stalked. Look there, do you see it? Derek suddenly said, voice shaky as they made their way back across Canal Street. On top of that building, there, look. Claire and Trevor followed Derek's finger and indeed saw what he was gesturing to. Standing atop a four-story building, staring down, were about two dozen goat-masked faithful. What are they up to? Claire asked. As if in response to her question, all of them raised their fingers to their lips in a hushed gesture. Derek looked around at the droves of people walking past them, all around them. Think anyone else can see them? In my experience, no, Trevor answered. One used to appear to my brother almost all of his life, ever since the night our father told him about our family legacy. Once Gregory told me about our connection to Tobit, one started appearing to me as well. I never saw more than one, though, and in all my dealings with it, no one else was ever able to see them. I want to get back inside that hotel. I don't feel safe out here, Claire insisted, and they finished making their way back to the hotel. Lena was waiting for them as they returned to the hotel. She was sitting in one of the chairs in the lobby. Everything okay? She asked. Just a little shaken up. We had a visit from the Delphian Welcoming Committee out there, Derek stated flatly. What happened? So, they explained to the former sister of Tobit, a woman they were now forced to trust, exactly what happened with the homeless people and the fanatics on the roof. She listened, nodding here and there, as if all this were as normal as the sunrise in the morning and the sunset in the evening. With the previous good cheer drained out of them from their shared encounters with the dark forces of Tobit, sleep was determined as the next step. In the morning, they agreed to all meet in Lena's room, where she would enchant the doorway, either doorway or bathroom would work just fine, and cross over into Delphia. They'd all expected to be plagued with nightmares on that last night in New Orleans. However, they all awoke and reported a solid night's sleep, with no midnight visits from demonic entities. They'd spent the morning silently preparing themselves for what awaited. Once everyone was ready, they met in Lena's room. She already had the door prepped. The Enchanted Door to Delphia They gathered around her hotel room closet. Nothing looked particularly special about it. So, this will really take us to Delphia? Derek asked. Yes, once you step through, you will be there. If I set this up right, we should arrive in a small safe house. Weapons will be there for us. We will meet up with the unwashed after we arrive and move into the next phase from there. Lena explained. No one seemed to be in a big rush to go first. Finally, Claire stepped up. Okay, if this works, I'll see you all on the other side. She didn't wait for any noble goodbyes or stoic words of commencement. She simply stepped into the closet. Once she crossed through, small snow flurries began to float from the closet. Claire! Trevor called into the closet. She's in Delphia now. See the snow? Lena answered. Derek and Trevor took one last cautious look at each other, and then stepped through themselves, followed by Lena leaving the sane world behind them and stepping into the heart of madness. When we stepped through the closet and into the little safe room, it turned out not to be so safe, Trevor had stated to Gregory, nearing completion of his story. 
We arrived in this tiny little grey room. We still weren't even sure where we were, honestly. Claire had gone through first, and she was standing there, a look of relief on her face as we all came through. Lena came in last. She told us to hold tight while she grabbed some armaments. Turns out there was only one firearm waiting there. Hers. She opened a crate and pulled out a pistol, and in the next second she was ordering us all down on our knees. We all just sort of stood there in shock for a second, not knowing what to do. Then the blue uniformed cops came bursting through the door, pushing us to the floor. We were shackled and brought to the tower. Since then, Trevor lived in the former Grand Magus' chambers. He'd not been allowed to see Claire or Derek. He had no idea what was going on. The last time he saw Lena, when she handed him over to his brother's custody, she'd whispered, Don't trust him, into Trevor's ear. So far, that was the last he'd seen of her. His brother came by daily to visit, and they would talk. Gregory had told Trevor all about how he'd become the champion of Tobit, about how he'd fallen into the good graces of Pinkerton and Tabitha. Over those last two weeks, he was fed well, given whatever he asked for as far as comfort items were concerned, but received no information as to what was going on outside of the chamber walls. The fates of his friends were still a mystery. His own fate was still shrouded in fear and uncertainty. Gregory now walked towards the Grand Magus's chambers, a room he thought of as his own for a little while, and then started thinking of as Trevor's room. Now he didn't quite know what to think of it. He'd lived long enough to have seen many efforts and projects of his destroyed. That was quite normal in the business world. He'd had proposals that he'd worked weeks on shot down in minutes. He'd had his ideas ignored. He'd seen failure enough times to know it from a block away. However, today, as he was watching television with Tabitha, he'd see a legacy destroyed. A legacy that was not just his, but one that had spanned several generations of Leary blood, starting with Brandon Leary, working its way down the line, finally landing on his father, and then on Gregory and Trevor themselves. That legacy to keep Delphia out of the public's mind, to keep Tobit locked away in secrecy. He'd always taken great pride in that, and today, in the course of a one-hour television program, he'd seen it all destroyed. He was furious. He kept thinking of everything he'd given up in his life to pursue this, the family he'd never started, the trips he'd never taken. He thought back to his interview when he was fresh out of college, the day a man named Mr. Blackman set him down for a dream job, a job lost because a member of the faithful had arrived and made flesh puppets behind Blackman's head. He thought about all the mental conditioning that he'd had to perfect in order to adjust to seeing the faithful around every corner, learning to live with them as though they were friends of his. Worst of all, he reflected on the night not very long ago. That night he made the painful choice to open Trevor up to the terrors of Tobit, when he allowed himself to ponder on the fact that, just a short time later, the whole world would be talking about Tobit regardless. It was enough to drive him into a blind rage. However, he could not allow his anger to take him there. It was too dangerous. Whatever accord he'd developed with Tabitha Shaw and Pinkerton, Gregory was willing to bet was delicate. After all, they'd watched in glee as he gunned down Lance Madison, a man who'd worked his way up to a high position there, a man who'd sold himself to Tobit. They'd demonstrated no real loyalty to him in the end. So what could Gregory hope to achieve here? Sure, they called him the champion, but... He knew pandering and manipulation when he saw it. He was content to allow them to believe he was strung along for now, if that's what it took to keep himself and Trevor safe. However, Gregory knew things inside of him had changed since seeing Newsroom, since listening to the cold hard facts, that the whole damned world was now aware, at least on some level, of Delphia and High Rock Tobit. Decisions would have to be made now, dangerous ones. He arrived at the Grand Magus' chambers, originally intending to enter and try to talk to Trevor, get his younger brother on board around here. He agreed with Tabitha that he'd have a hard time selling Trevor's residence here should he still be brooding when the man known as Pinkerton returned. Pinkerton had been absent from Delphia since the day Gregory had arrived, and it was now apparent exactly what he'd been up to. Gregory extended his arm to the door handle, then stopped again. Tough decisions, that's what he thought. Dangerous choices, too. That's what had been on his mind as he walked towards his chambers. Pinkerton had gone out and destroyed his family's legacy. That was also Gregory's original conclusion on the idea. 
But Hattie? Gregory realized that there was still one last option on the table here, one he'd initially dismissed. He wanted to work with Delphia, that much was true. From the belly of the beast, he was confident that he could keep everything under control. However, there was more to it than just that. He also had other interests in Delphia. For one, the oil. All that oil. Gregory was well aware that Antarctica housed tons of oil and natural gases just waiting to be refined and sold. He also knew that, due to a treaty signed a long time ago, that there could be no drilling on Antarctica for many more decades to come. The idea of using Delphia, a place masked from the world by magic, to dig into that oil was something he'd considered for a while. He could bring the men in himself to set up the equipment, and then just train the sea of slaves that lived against their will right here in the city to work the machinery. He could sell it and never worry over competition. He'd actually crunched the numbers on this project and written it all up in his little notebook that he kept in his jacket pocket. He considered showing it to Tabitha so that he could go to Pinkerton with some real support when he proposed it, but due to her mood since the arrival of Lena, he decided it might not be such a great idea to bother her with such request right now. He'd wait on that one. That, however, had been when he believed that he'd won by becoming Tobit's champion. He was confident that he'd ridden his family of the curse of Tobit, and therefore had completed his goal. He had been overjoyed at knowing he was the first in a long line of Learys that had actually finished what his uncle had started. However, the newsroom report changed it all. Now Tobit was all over the news. He remembered the night that he decided not to show the police the little chalk drawing of his murdered father that he'd found in the small utility building. It was evidence. The police should have seen it. But he declined that because he did not want the name of Tobit spreading about. He gave up so much more than just that throughout his life, all in the name of the Leary family legacy. He even stood before Tobit's congregation and accepted their madness in order to continue the family business. But Pinkerton had felt otherwise. He'd somehow revealed that red star to the world. And now, at least according to Jack Elder of Newsroom, the whole damned world was talking about Tobit. This now opened up options to Gregory, or rather, forced them on him. He, without knowing it, began using the theory of two for his own gains. On one hand, he could remain here in Delphia and work his best to contain things. Perhaps he could convince Pinkerton to remove the red star from the sky, but that choice opened up two more options that he didn't really want to explore. He could imagine trying to convince that slimy little man to do anything against his own devices to be a task born in hell. He had no desire to take that ride. Of course, speaking out against the will of Pinkerton, even as a simple matter of opinion, could result in a fate worse than death. He couldn't forget how easily they'd turned on Madison, a man who'd been loyal for longer than Gregory cared to imagine. That left Gregory with the other option, one he didn't like any more than the other, but one that perhaps could be accomplished yet. He wanted to sample it at the very least, to see what lurked there. It was a gamble, but, of course, so was just about everything these days. So, without allowing himself much time to dwell on it, he walked past the Grand Magus' chamber doors, allowing Trevor to remain undisturbed, and made his way out into the city of Delphia. Nephew and Uncle Divided It didn't take long for Gregory Leary to be marked. They'd been watching him intently, ever since his little stun at the cathedral when he turned on Clive and Emily, giving them over to Pinkerton. It had been a bizarre night, to say the least. First, they'd watched him shoot Madison, and their first thoughts had been that Gregory was in fact their savior, a man finally striking a real blow to the forces that be. He'd then returned, claiming ownership of rank in Delphia, and giving two unwashed away without a second thought. Where the man stood and where his loyalties lie was still a mystery, so they'd been watching him over the last two weeks. Over that time, they'd found that he rarely toured Delphia alone. He was almost always in the company of Tabitha Shaw. Today, though, he was alone, and from the look on his face, not in good spirits. Perhaps something had happened that had changed his perspective on things. Perhaps he was just having a bad day and needed time to himself. Either way, the outcome was the same. The time for action was here. Things needed to be done now. 
and Gregory Leary had proven to be a bit of a monkey wrench in the grand machine of things. Now, though, he was alone and vulnerable. What value he may still have sits in mystery, but the time for wondering was behind them. Things were moving too fast now to stop and think about anything except for the immediate goal. They watched as Gregory moved from the populated hub of Delphia, the shops and the restaurants, the street vendors and the masses of people moving about. He turned towards the warehouses, a place where foot traffic was seldom. The watchers began to wonder if this was a ploy. He seemed to be moving in that direction intentionally. However, as was stated before, the time for concern about the unknown was moving on, and the time for action was here. It was time to take action. Once he was in an isolated part of the city, they made their move. Gregory left with the intention of being seen. He was hoping for contact. However, he was not sure how it would come to him. Once he was alone among the storage buildings, he made himself look like a man looking for a man, if that makes sense. He had his head down, but his ears were up. He figured contact would be made quickly. When he rounded a building and found himself in a small and narrow alleyway, he wasn't surprised to hear footsteps coming behind him quickly. Took you long enough. I was starting to. There was a heavy thud that cut off Gregory's sentence. He heard it more in the back of his head than he actually felt it. The world slowly started to go gray around him as he noticed the ground was suddenly rising up to meet him. He had no real time to register any solid thought on the matter, for as the ground met his face, his world went black. Gregory Leary awoke some time later in a small room lit with a gas lantern. He was aware of an intense headache and a throb on the right side of his face. His hands also sent waves of discomfort through his arms. He rubbed his fingers into his palms and felt scratches there. His mouth was dry and his back hurt. He attempted to stand and found that his arms and legs were bound to the chair. A nervous fear began to eat into the pit of his stomach. Where... where am I? He spoke weakly. You're awake at last, lad. At first I was starting to think you were going to sleep through the night. A familiar voice replied. Brandon, Gregory asked into the darkness around him. Indeed, nephew. It seems we meet again. The voice of Brandon Leary replied. Why did you bring me here? Why did you jump me from behind? There was a flicker of light from a corner of the room. Gregory could see his uncle lighting a cigar. The match flicked out and Brandon Leary walked into the light. He dragged a chair from the darkness behind him and sat down opposite of his nephew. Bring him some water, Brandon ordered. A large dipper was suddenly in front of Gregory's face and water sloshed out into his lap. It was cold and the bound man's lips suddenly wetted with want. Go on, give it to him. The dipper rose to his mouth. Gregory couldn't see who was holding it out for him, but he didn't care. He was thirsty. He ducked his head down and began to drink greedily from the dipper. Once his captor felt he'd had enough, the dipper was pulled away, leaving Gregory to face his uncle once more. We've gotten ourselves into a fine mess here, haven't we, lad? Asked the leader of the unwashed. Tobit, the whole world knows about him now. Pinkerton revealed some star and it's causing people to go crazy. The nephew replied. And now you know how it feels to have your entire life's mission crushed. Is that what brings you here, Gregory? Your failures? I wanted to talk to you, uncle, to make things right. Ha! Huh, Brandon replied, saying the word more than actually laughing. You want to make things right now? Now that you've gone and tossed this entire operation into the shitter, now you come out here and want to make things right. I trusted you, Gregory. I really did. I didn't like the nephew that I met, but I believed in our family. You have let me down, lad. Let us all down. I'm sorry, uncle. No, you're not, Gregory. You're sorry that you lost control of things, that's what you're sorry for. I gave you every chance to come in with us, to help in really bringing Delphia down. I gave you the identity of Emily and Clive in hopes that you do the right thing. I shouldn't have, and this is my cross to bear every second they are sitting in the dungeon. I was a fool for that. And do you know why I wanted to trust you so badly, Gregory? Do you really want to know why? Gregory nodded. Because, lad, I'm tired. I've been here almost two centuries, fighting the same fight all the time, 
praying for the day that Delphia falls so that I can finally rest. When I saw you show up here in Delphia, I just wanted so badly to believe that you were here to relieve me from this duty. I wanted to believe that whatever gods govern all of this shit, that they'd finally decided to give an old man a day off. My body may not age here, but, lad, my mind surely has. When I first arrived here, stowing away on Madison's boat, sneaking into the city, I intended to arrest the man. Yeah, that was the plan. In the name of Scotland Yard and all that, I was going to arrest Madison and bring him back to London to stand trial for his crimes. Imagine the shock when I realized that I was trapped here with him. No escape. To make matters worse, I find out that this city has its own damned army. Those coppers out there, plus all of the faithful. Can you picture a fat man going into the cathedral, removing my badge and just ordering Madison to come with me? I wouldn't have been dead before the arrest order could leave my lips. So, I did the only logical thing I could think. If they had an army, I would need one too. It took me over a century to really get the unwashed together, to get the right people in the right places. Eventually, I recruited enough high-ranking folks in Madison's court, enough for us to learn the city's one great weakness. However, for every step we took, Pinkerton was there to push us two steps back. If we took a foot, they pushed us back a yard. It was always an uphill battle, Gregory. A daily battle, it would seem. So imagine my joy when one of my very own shows up here. I thought it was a sign that the tide was turning. They warned me. Hell, everyone did, not to trust you because of who you were and what family line you came from. I should have listened, but I gave in to my own mental fatigue and I trusted a snake. You. And now two of my most trusted people are in the dungeon, undergoing God knows what kind of torture because of my own nephew. They've not been tortured, Uncle. This I know. Tabitha has been too caught up with the death of one of her agents. She hasn't even been down there. They're waiting for Pinkerton to return to make any big moves. I won't bother to beat the truth out of you, lad. It's not my style anyway. No, it's your new friends that are fond of the heavy hand. We're making our move now. No more waiting. You at least were useful enough to show me that the time for patience has passed. When a man cannot trust his own flesh and blood, there's no more time left at all. You will stay here. You will be kept company. Know that the man in this room with you is armed with a loaded pistol. Should you make any wrong moves, he is under instruction to blow your head off. Once we are done, once the mission is carried out, the man will untie you and leave with the rest of us. You will wait a few moments for him to clear the room, and then you are free to make your way to the main gate as well. I don't have the brains nor the heart to kill you, although every instinct of mine says to do just that. Uncle, please, if I'm gone for too long, Tabitha will come looking for me, and if she finds me like this, people will die. Likely your friends first. Brandon Leary stood up and began to walk towards the exit. Lad, we're moving into action now. Your girlfriend up there in the tower isn't going to have time to look for you. Remember, don't try anything funny. I don't want you to be killed, but I doubt I'll lose much sleep if you are. Too many regrets robbing me of my rest as it is. You'd be so far in the back of the line that I'd die of old age before you made it halfway. With that, Brandon Leary left his nephew tied up and under guard. Gregory could hear the man breathing close behind him, watching him from the darkness, ready to kill him if necessary. The Logic of Grief Back in the tower, Tabitha was impatiently flipping through television channels. She wasn't really watching the programs any longer. No, her mind was elsewhere and was simply hoping that her shows could distract her from what she knew she really wanted to do. Lacey continued to bob in and out of her mind, her face, smiling and so full of joy, so dedicated to all the tasks before her. She remembered the night with the dead baby, the night she'd shown up and taken Lacey away from her world of rules and bloodshed, and brought her into one with one simple goal, serve Tobit in all ways. She'd always been Tabitha's favorite, there'd never been a doubt, and now she was dead, supposedly taken down by a very lucky police officer. As she told Gregory, she didn't believe that, not even for a second. She wanted to believe that Lena had lied to her to spare her the punishment for the action she'd no doubt have taken. She wanted to move on as well. She'd lost agents before, 
Serving Tobit as a sister was never going to be a job that came without very high risks. Still, she wasn't letting it go. She wasn't moving on. Tabitha was a young woman who knew herself better than most others in this world. She knew she couldn't and wouldn't let it be, not until she was satisfied. She also was starting to develop anger towards Lena for lying to her. She'd done a fairly good job of keeping herself at bay by simply telling herself that Lena had done these things for the good of her leader. But the more she thought about it, the more she realized that lying was still lying, and Tabitha was not a woman that appreciated lies from her subordinates. Lying is like any other bad habit. You do it once and get away with it, and suddenly you feel you can do it all the time. Wait for Pinkerton, girly, Tabitha said out loud. It was good advice. She already knew the little girl, Soka, was a big supporter of the unwashed. She had yet to make a move against her, though, wanting everything to come together as a beautiful surprise for Mr. Pinky when he came back to Delphia. She'd hand over Derek and Claire, and she'd tell Pinky all about how she'd learned the identity of the little psychic girl among the rebels, and how the whole damned unwashed was about to crumble. It was a good plan. A plan that would mean rewards for her and a much brighter future ahead. This was a good plan. Sounds like a pussy plan to me, girly. A voice spoke inside of Tabitha's head. It's not. It's the right course of action. We wait. She replied to the voice. Wait and see, eh? Sounds like you're losing your edge, Tabby. That's what I think. I would never have imagined the little girl that survived this shack could grow into something so pathetic. The voice answered. Tabitha stood up and gazing back at her from the mirror on the wall was her stalwart companion in the goat mask. The same woman who told her to kill Soka when she was in the dream world with them. Tabitha gazed at her own reflection, the only difference being the mask. She listened as her own voice ordered her to take action. Listen, girly, you can sit up here in your big room all day if you want, just brooding, watching television, fucking your new man, and all the while, the unwashed laugh at you. Big bad Tabitha, too afraid to come out of her own room and face what must be done. You know Lena is lying, but do you know why she's lying? To protect me, Tabitha answered her reflection. The reflection laughed. To protect you? Tabby, you really are stupid, aren't you? Do you remember the night we went and rescued Lena? Remember the choices that you gave her? Join you or be brought back here and fed to Madison's congregation? Remember that? Yeah, you should because I bet you all the money in the world that Lena sure as hell remembers it. You really think she'd lie for you? Girlie, I worry about you sometimes. Then she lied to protect herself to avoid being punished for losing a sister. Tabitha argued back to the mirror. That makes even less sense, Tabby. Much less. The truth or a lie would have added up the same for Lena in most cases. If she was killed by Derek Reynolds, as you believe, or if she were killed by some police officer, as she told you, losing a sister is still losing a sister, isn't it? So who was that lie to protect? Her? It wasn't. Unless, of course... Unless, of course, what? Lena never wanted to come here, did she, girly? Not at first, no, but in time she... Think about it. In time what? She had decades to think about you, Tabitha, to think about her place in Delphia, did she not? You loved Lacey because she was so eager to be part of it all, but you always wondered about Lena, didn't you? She never gave me reason to question her. Not until recently, anyway, right? Right. So test her, Tabby. Test her now and be done with it, rather than spending the next decade wondering what really went wrong on that mission. Tabitha nodded to her reflection slowly, knowing now what needed to be done.